This is the Pico Calc by Clockwork Pi. It is a modern handheld retro computer that runs off of a Raspberry Pi Pico. I recently got my hands on one, had to wait several months for my order to come, and nowadays if you want to get one, I hear you have to pay a lot of money on eBay or just join the queue. I'm running here off of USB power because my battery is over here chilling getting a charge. It runs off of two 18650 batteries that run in parallel so you can run on one at a time if you need to recharge them and don't want to uh, take a break in your gaming. It supports the Pico 1 and the Pico 2 and both W variants as well. I'm running a custom version of a Pico 2 that has some PS RAM installed so you see here that it's properly detected the six megabytes of PS RAM. The Clockwork Pi, as delivered, comes with a PicoMite MM Basic operating environment. It's basically a basic operating system. It's got some basic file handling and directory manipulation uh, routines. There is an A drive, which you access by A colon. And if we do files, we can see the files that are on there. This is the internal flash of the PicoCalc. There's also a B drive, and we can list the files that are there as well. And I've got a lot of a lot of junk on here. You can see that, and this is contained in the SD card on the side. You can store all your program files on the SD card. Uh, you can store ROMs, uh, alternate ROMs on the SD card. I created a little Mandelbrot demo I'm going to show you here. Here you can see my little program running. It's generating a Mandelbrot set, and we can zoom in. And you can see that it's actually quite fast, not comparable to modern desktop computers, uh, but certainly faster than any retro computer has any right to be. It's got a built-in full-featured editor, which is really, really cool. If you want to take your programming on the go, you can scroll through your giant Mandelbrot program or whatever else you've made here, and you can edit and change things on the fly. Display is a 320 by 320 IPS full color, so 24-bit display, so it does some beautiful colors as you saw in the Mandelbrot demo. Um, it's totally appropriate for gaming, has pretty high, high performance, high refresh rate, and so forth. We will see there's an NES emulator for the Pico Calc, and you can load that, and it does a really good job of playing retro games. One of the best ways of getting files on and off the Pico Calc is just via the SD card, so if you find a demo online, uh, you can go ahead and load it onto the SD card and copy it over, and that's what I'm going to do here. I'm going to load a little demo I found on the internet. I'll put the source of that in the notes. Okay, I've loaded up a little demo here. Okay, we're going to go ahead and run this. just a cute little basic demo somebody put together. Certainly uh, not pushing the limits of, you know, graphics ability of this platform because it's written in basic. Although it does show what the Pico Cal can do and how nice its screen really is. Somebody wrote a nice little mod file player. I don't know if that's built into MM Basic or not. I think it might be. That's a cute one. I think there might be a little bit of a bug in there. Next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna flash the NES emulator. So the way you do that is there's these vents in the back here. You can just kind of see the outline of the Raspberry Pi Pico. The uh, venting on the back allows for some cooling of the Raspberry Pi Pico, and it also allows you to get at the boot button here. So I'm gonna go ahead and press that button down as I plug in the power. And you need to put it into the USB slot for the Raspberry Pi Pico because we're going to be programming that. There are two USB-C ports. One is for the main board of the computer. We'll talk about that functionality in a little bit. It's mostly just peripherals communicating to the outside and communicating with the display and also a keyboard controller. The brains of the operation are the Raspberry Pi Pico. So the way that you program it is you hold down the boot button while you're plugging in the USB cable and then you let up the boot button and then you should see the Raspberry Pi 
drive appear here. And this is kind of a fake USB drive. You can't really store anything here, but you can drag across the firmwares. So we're gonna drag across the Pico Calc NES firmware and I've stored this, I've saved off some PicoCab versions in my firmware folder on the SD card that I use to uh, transfer files back and forth. So we just drag this over the RP2350 drive and we see that it's copying and then it should reboot and restart. All right, so my batteries are recharged here or at least close enough batteries go in here and pay attention, it's easy to install them backwards and that would probably be bad. They wanna be installed in parallel and you can run on one battery or the other. It's kinda of cool that way. Okay, so let's go ahead and do uh, Donkey Kong. I think the issue here is that I'm using PS RAM. So let's go ahead and open this up and swap in a more stock Raspberry Pi Pico. So I'm gonna go ahead and take the batteries out. And this should lift off relatively easily. Oh, I missed a screw. So you can see the case, this is a very high quality injection molded case, you know, very well done. Got the clockwork logo on here, vents, uh, came with some stickers to label the GPIO and voltage ports on the side so you can actually plug in external little experiments like if you wanted to do an analog to digital or control some hardware or control an LED string or something like that, you can use those pins to do that. And you can see my custom dev board here which is not working with the stock installation of the NES program. It just plugs into the standard pin header for a Raspberry Pi Pico, and then I've got some additional pins that uh, I support, and we've got the Radio Module 2 soldered on and the PS RAM, which I think is the culprit. So the main board here is relatively nice. It's got a socket for your Raspberry Pi Pico. It's got the USB port that allows you to flash the ROM for this board, and I believe this is just an STM32 that's mostly responsible for controlling the keyboard. We've got a ribbon cable for the display, and if we flip this up, we should be able to remove that nicely. And we'll talk about the display in a minute, because if you order one of these, you need to be very, very careful with the display. I broke mine, and the forums are just full of reports of people breaking their displays. So here's the front of it with the uh, keyboard matrix, a nice little, little logo there, the version number, and I don't know what's there. Oh, we've got some pads for the speakers. So the speakers are right there, and it's really cool. They have these little push pin pads that uh, push into there from the PCB. And then you have the SD card and audio volume. When you get the Pico Calc, it comes disassembled, and the display is in a separate package and so forth, and you have to put all of this together. Take out the display very, very gingerly. Place it in here. Make sure to remove the protective coating fully. Do that very, very carefully and then tape it down in here. It cannot move after you put it in. So if you just leave it sitting in there, um, the process of you taking off the back cover will allow that display to move around enough that it will probably break itself. It's very, very easy to do. So if you tape it down, I have just a little bit of the blue tape, just blue masking tape or masking tape or anything like that will work. It just keeps it in place and keeps it from bumping around when you disassemble your Pico Calc. Now there's the uh, keyboard matrix. So those are, that's cool little, cool little SMD mounted clicky, clicky button guy. To put it back together, we thread the ribbon cable through the slit here. And there we go, we gotta put that up fully. And a lot of people, when they damage their screens, they think that they might have done something wrong, they hurt the ribbon cable, mal-seated the ribbon cable. It's unlikely. If you do see some corruption on your screen, it's probably because you broke it. You'd certainly try and reseat that cable, but the vast majority of cases I've seen, it's people actually damage their screen. Let's go ahead and put the batteries back in. And we're gonna try a version of my uh, custom board here that doesn't have PS RAM enabled. I think that is the issue. Oops, that's easy to put on the wrong one. Yep, that was the issue.
No. The keyboard controls are not ideal. Oh, he got me. Let's see what else is in here. Elevator Madness, Marble Madness doesn't work. Interesting thing is you can only use the single size ROM. So anything over 41 kilobytes doesn't work because this NES emulator doesn't implement any of the mappers, I think is what they're called in the NES world. So basically you're a little bit limited in terms of the ROMs that this will play. Ah. The controller is a little bit better here. Oh, let's see if I can do the power jump with this keyboard. Oh, oh, that wasn't bad. Ha! Anyway, you get the basic idea. You can play the large catalog, at least, of original NES carts that didn't use mappers. Some of the other firmwares that are available, Fuzzix, it is a Unix-like operating system. There's also MicroPython is available for the PicoCal. I haven't tried that out yet. I wanna get around to using that. And there's also an MP3 player. I haven't tried that out because I don't have the right version for my Raspberry Pi Pico. So that's one of the interesting things. The firmwares are specific to the brand of the Pico chip that you have. This is an RP. This is an RP2040. That's what kind of the default. And this is an RP2350. So you can see the difference in size. This is a considerably more capable, faster chip. This is a little bit slower, but a little bit more compatible. So if you have an RP2030, you will have to get firmwares that are specifically compiled for that architecture. So that complicates things, but this is all available open source. The entire code library for the MM Basic PicoMite operating environment that comes default shipped on here is open source and available and they've got some pretty good instructions on how to recompile it for different targets. So it's very open, very hackable. You can go in and go in and change things. You could add your own basic commands to it if you wanted to. That's really pretty cool. It's this entire device is meant to be eminently hackable. And that's one of the other things I wanted to talk about is just the huge amount of space that you have in here. And it's a little bit of a side effect of the fact that they chose to mount your Raspberry Pi Pico on these header pins, which create you know, a, little, a good amount of clearance need for that. And then also the giant 18650 batteries in here. But that creates a lot of empty space in here. And it created enough room for me to install my very hackable um, custom dev board here that has all these extra pins I could do some fun things with. I could run them out via a connector or a hole in the case or something like that. You can add new connectors or holes to this case if you want to. You can 3D print your own new case back to do something different. But there's also a lot of room for other things in here. So I've seen custom LED mods where people add some RGB lighting to to the back of their Pico cap. Just a lot of opportunities when you have this much space to do stuff even inside the case. So you could add other hardware you're here, other sensors, other processors, and so forth. Alternate video displays. It's an imminently hackable platform. And this cool little GPIO header here on the side speaks to that as well. You can see here the GPIO pin outputs so you can control or read data from external projects. Very, very cool. Well, let's go ahead and put him back together. There we go. Cool, we're back to base basics. Oh, one of the other things I forgot to mention that there is a PicoCalc Lisp library in the original stock distribution as well. I haven't checked that out. There's just, there's a number of different firmwares out there. So it's kind of a, like an open platform. Um, the C SDK for the Raspberry Pi Pico is relatively comprehensive, and this is a known good hardware target. So it's a really cool common platform for people to develop for because you get the same hardware no matter what. Remember I was talking about, I didn't know if there was a built-in mod file player. Here it is, I think. I don't know how I get that to stop though. Maybe if I edit a program, yeah, there we go. You can also play MP3s. Oh, you know what? Actually, I've got an MP3 player in here. Load. We got some MP3s on here. 
I think they're just kind of no copyright stuff that I put on here. Let me select from them. So it's got a built-in mod player, it's got a built-in MP3 player, very cool. So you can imagine if you wanted to put some work into creating a much more sophisticated basic interface, you could create a relatively complicated MP3 player. The feeling in your hand, it's a very solid, hefty piece of equipment, especially with the batteries in it. If you get some good ones, should last for quite a while. I love the kind of the clicky keyboard. It does miss some keys every once in a while, which is kind of frustrating. So you kind of have to watch the screen as you're typing to make sure that what's actually going in there. I wouldn't want to spend long sessions in here actually editing code on here, which brings me to the last thing that I wanted to show you, the fact that you can share the screen on your computer. So I'm going to plug in the USB cable here. We can connect to the USB port using screen on Mac OS. You can also use putty like if you use Windows. So now we can actually edit things on our computer as they scroll back and forth on the screen. And this is bi-directional, so <laughs> it's so cool. So if I type something here, uh, it gets typed on the computer screen and vice versa. Let's see if we run this, if it goes on the screen. Oh, nice, okay, yeah. Yeah, it's actually taking keyboard input as well. But it won't show graphics output, so this just does the text mode. If we went into, say, my Mandelbrot player, we wouldn't see the Mandelbrot on the terminal. So this is cool for just text mode, and you can also do Xmodem transfers. Although I'm not going to show an Xmodem transfer because it's more of a pain than you remember from the 80s. This is an awesome little device and a lot of thought went into it, and the cool thing is that it's a standardized hardware target that a lot of people can develop towards, so everybody will get the same thing. It's got a known display, it's got known audio audio output uh, options, it's got known GPIO pins and so forth, um, a known keyboard, so people can release software with a relatively good idea that it's going to work on your Pico Calc, and that's really quite cool and quite different in the space of, you know, hacking hardware. So they've created, PicoCalc has created this kind of standard platform. So what are the downsides? Well, it's hard to get a hold of right now. Clockwork Pi is incredibly behind on their order backlog and people are reporting waits of many, many months to get theirs. I think I waited about two months. I think they're a relatively small shop, but a professional shop. Even though my screen broke, I emailed them and they immediately sent out a brand new screen free of charge. They seem to be very generous with free screens because I think they realize how fragile that screen is. I really would appreciate from them better assembly directions and better warnings around the fragility of that display. But other than that, it, this is just a joy to use. It's fun to retro game on. It's fun to code in MM Basic and see the results on your screen. In the coming months, I'm gonna try out some of the other firmwares that are available for the Pico Calc, and I expect that over the next couple of years, there's gonna be a huge explosion of different sorts of firmware that target this platform.